time. Uh, early on in its uh, in its history, it was uh, probably the height of the Himalayas, or at least the Rocky Mountains, uh, and has eroded away uh, over time. Uh, the region that that I'm interested in in particular is the Southern Appalachian region, which covers about nine or covers parts of nine states. Uh, it's about 85,000 square miles. It includes the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains, the Ridge and Valley Province. So this is the Blue Ridge here, the Ridge and Valley Province, and then the Cumberland Plateau. And the highest point, uh, as you may know, is uh, Mount Mitchell, uh, just a little bit outside of Asheville at about 66 or 6,700 feet elevation. Uh, it is the highest point in North America, east of the Mississippi River. Uh, so the Southern Appalachians, as you can see from uh, from this map here, there's a great uh, variety in the topography. So there are lower areas and, and higher areas. There are differences in in climate uh, in terms of the amount of water or rain that falls, uh, the amount of uh, or the temperatures. So uh, very cold temperatures at places like Mount Mitchell compared to warmer temperatures in northern Alabama, for example. Um, and it's a it's an interesting region in, in terms of the land use history that it's uh, experienced. Uh, so it was compared to a lot of the Eastern United States, it was relatively untouched by development and logging and that sort of thing until the late 1800s and the early 1900s when there was a fair amount of very destructive uh, logging, uh, unsustainable forestry practices clearing it at large scales that uh, created uh, environmental issues, as you can imagine, and sort of an outcry in response to that that led to the creation of many protected areas that we that we cherish to this day, including places like Mount Mitchell State Park, Grandfather Mountain, uh, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, Shenandoah National Park, places like that. So those were places that were created in response to these unsustainable environmental uh, practices that took place uh, about 100 years ago, a little more than 100 years ago. Uh, there has been a re fairly recent influx of people into parts of the Southern Appalachian mountain uh, area, and that uh, is leading to some concerns about uh, sustainability for the long term as well. And we also have concerns about uh, climate change and how that's going to affect uh, the region as well. So one reason I am so interested in the Southern Appalachians is that it is a global biodiversity hotspot in a lot of different ways. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a plant ecologist, a forest ecologist, so I'm really interested in, in uh, plants and, and in particular trees. But just as an aside, uh, the, the Southern App Appalachian region is the number one uh, global hotspot for uh, salamander diversity. So uh, nowhere else in the world can you go and find more uh, more different salamander species. So, but I'm not a I'm not a zoologist, uh, but it is it is really fascinating, and it's it's this uh, it's this evolutionary cauldron, this place that has so much climate variability. It has soil and topographic variability. So climate variability, for for example, so. Uh, in parts of the uh, the Appalachians in sort of southwestern North Carolina, these are some of the wettest places uh, in uh, the continental United States. You go less than 100 miles to somewhere like Asheville, and Asheville is actually a fairly dry place. Uh, comparatively, it's in a rain shadow. Uh, so there's a lot of that variability. Again, you get to the highest peaks and it's you're up there this time of year and it is frigid. It is places like Mount Mitchell and Grandfather Mountain, Roan Mountain. These are places that are essentially like being in, in Canada uh, as compared to much warmer locations at, at lower elevations. So a lot of uh, climate variability, soil and topographic variability that is, you know, slopes and uh, and, ask, and um, elevation and, and that sort of thing. Uh, the biogeographic history of the, the region is really fascinating I, uh, too, uh, I think. So if we think about sort of the deep time, so going back uh, to 66 million years ago, uh, 
uh, the end of the Cretaceous era when the dinosaurs uh, went extinct. Uh, since then, till about uh, three million years ago, the Southern Appalachian region was warmer and moister than it is uh, today. Uh, that uh, that uh, uh, led to the ability for species to uh, evolve into lots of different uh, uh, forms and to, to fit different environmental niches and that sort of thing. And one really fascinating aspect of this is that a lot of the species that we find in the, in the Appalachians and eastern United States as well exist only there and in eastern Asia. So uh, when we go back to 40 million years ago or so, there was a connection uh, over where Alaska is now between the forests of Eastern Asia and, and the Eastern United States, or Eastern North America. So um, there's there was a lot in common. There was an exchange of, of organisms between those places over the long term. So that's an aside, but but an interesting one, I think. More recently, so if you think so you think about the ice ages, so we call this the Pleistocene uh, era uh, or period which lasted from about 2.6 million years ago to about 12,000 years ago. This was a period of repeated cycles of uh, glaciation and warming. So the, the ice caps would move south and then they would, uh, the temperature would warm and they'd move north again over many thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. Uh, there were no glaciers as far south as the Appalachians. Uh, there was probably tundra at, in, the, in the highest elevations but uh, the species that uh, existed in this region were, were probably species that now exist a lot further north. So it became an area of glacial refuge, essentially, as species moved south, as the, uh, the, the temperature cooled and the ice caps expanded, and then they moved north again or uphill. And that was made possible by the fact that the 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 mountains in the Southern Appalachians run from southwest to northeast. So uh, when we look at the Alps in, in Europe, for example, the Alps run east to west. So what happened in, in Europe during this period was that uh, species, as the, the climate cooled, they got, they got essentially slammed up against the mountains and were unable to persist. So as a result, uh, our our forest biodiversity in uh, eastern North America is a lot greater than in Europe, even though we have similar climate conditions. So when we when you visit the, the southern Appalachians, you can run into lots of different forest types. Uh, rich cove forests are beautiful places, lots of hardwoods, giant tulip poplars and uh, and sweet gums and, and things like that. Uh, there are moist hemlock and rhododendron forests along rivers and streams. You get up on ridges, um, you find drier oak hickory and, and chestnut forests. Uh, chestnut, unfortunately, is mostly gone for reasons uh, I may touch on later. Uh, there, you get on the driest, highest, rockiest ridges, and you'll run into pine forests, and then you get to the highest elevation forests, uh, like places like Mount Mitchell and, and the, the Great Smoky Mountains, Klingman's Dome there, that you run into the boreal forests, so forests that are like uh, the ones up in Canada. Uh, and the Southern Appalachians are, for the reasons that I talked about on that last slide, uh, a a real hotspot, both of species diversity and genetic diversity within species. Uh, so just talking about Great Smoky Mountains National Park, for example, there are about 130 tree species there, which is almost as many as all of Europe. And uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park is, is tiny compared to the entire continent of Europe. So unfortunately, uh, several of the species, tree species that uh, exist in the Southern Appalachians are imperiled for various reasons. So I mentioned the American chestnut was wiped out. Uh, mostly it still exists, it's not extinct, but uh, it's sort of functionally extinct. You can find American chestnuts, but they're not really an important part of the landscape anymore. Uh, it was wiped out beginning about 100 years ago as a result of a, a pathogen, a disease that was introduced from 
uh, from Europe. Uh, white ash, so this is uh, a species that, that exists here as well, but is being decimated by emerald ash borer, a non-native uh, insect. Uh, and some of these, like big leaf magnolia and yellowwood, are are just rare species to begin with. So they they are um, susceptible to uh, to extinction as a result of uh, disturbances, like a big hurricane uh, for a given population, for example. But uh, several of these, as you'll you'll notice, are uh, conifers, and these are the species that. I'm going to talk about these are the species that I've worked uh, a fair amount with in my job as a uh, as a conservation biologist and conservation geneticist. So what do we mean by conifers? So, of course, uh, in North Carolina, uh, where our state tree is the pine tree, uh, not specific to what species that is, it is the pine tree, uh, we see pines all over the place and, and a lot of people probably think uh, you know, conifers are pines, uh, and that, that, so all pines are conifers, however, but not all conifers are, are pines. So, uh, in North Carolina, we have, uh, 16 native conifer, uh, tree species, and only half of those are pines. It's still a fair number, and they're great species, uh, including longleaf pine, which is, which is one of my favorite, not in the Appalachians, at least, uh, not in, in North Carolina, uh, but there are other groups as well that that I that I will talk about and and help you to be able to identify if you're up in the woods out there. Uh, so there are four in particular. So these are these are uh, called genera, or each of these is a genus, uh, single for uh, sing, so genus genera. So it's a Latin name. So a single genus of pinus for pine. Suga for hemlock, uh, abies for fir, and picea for spruce. So that, that's the scientific genus or genera is the uh, the plural for that because that's a Latin word. So I'll talk about each of those uh, genera within the, the pine family, uh, broader, more broadly speaking, and uh, help you to be able to identify uh, which is which. So Pines, uh, most people can identify a pine, I think. Uh, they have heavy wooden cones that hang down from a tree. They uh, take two years to uh, mature, very woody, very robust. Uh, and there's usually uh, like a prickle at the end of uh, each scale on it. Not always, but, but most of the time. Hemlocks, on the other hand, are, they have, they have cones that are, uh, small, uh, much smaller than, than pine trees. They're woody. Uh, they hang down, uh, uh, as do uh, pines, uh, but the, the scales are, are really pretty thin. Uh, similar, but, but a little bit different, are the cones of spruces. So these are also woody, um, the kind of thin scales. They hang down from the tree. They tend to be oblong uh, and much larger or generally larger than, than hemlocks at least in the eastern United States. Uh, and then finally, uh, the, the funkiest of the lot is the firs. So these guys have cones that are upright. So rather than hanging down from a branch, they're on top of a branch. Uh, and the, the cones are papery. That is, the, the scales of them are, are papery. They don't hang together uh, and fall on the ground like like pines and, and hemlocks and spruces do. What happens is they dry out in the fall, uh, they'll shatter and the wind blows away the scales and the, and the seeds and everything. So you would be very lucky to be able to find a, uh, a fir cone on the ground. So that's, that's the cones, uh, but we need to talk about the needles too, um, another way to, to identify these different species. So uh, pines, as, as most people probably have recognized, have fairly long, thin, flexible needles. They usually come in clusters of two, three, or five, depending on, on what kind of pine they are. Uh, flexible, but, you know, can be a little pokey at the, at the ends. Hemlocks, on the other hand, have these uh, smallish, flat, flexible needles uh, that are attached by a little peg-like stem. Uh, 
uh, which you can kind of make out in these photos uh, here. And that, that becomes important because uh, hemlock needles look a little bit like, like fir needles, uh, but, but there are some important differences. Spruces, uh, on the other hand, have a fairly inflexible needles, so they're, they're very stiff. Uh, they're angled in cross section, so if you take one and roll it, you can roll it between your fingers. You can't really do that with a with a hemlock or a, or a fir cone, uh, and they have these pointed tips. So, uh, sort of the, a way to to remember uh, that is to remember that spruces are spiky. So if you shake hands with a spruce, uh, it's not necessarily a pleasant experience. Uh, firs, on the other hand, uh, they have these flat, flexible single needles again. Um, so the only one of these that, that have clusters of needles is, is pines. Uh, they're often spirally uh, arranged around the branch, what we call a bottle brush kind of look. Not always, but, but a lot of the time. Uh, and they have rounded tips, they're flexible, uh, and the, the nanomic here to remember is that furs are friendly. So if you shake hands with a, a fur, uh, that it is, it's a more pleasant experience than shaking a hand, shaking hands with a spruce. And that's important because a red spruce and Fraser fir grow together uh, in arboreal forests uh, in the highest elevations in North Carolina. Uh, and how you tell furs apart from hemlocks is that uh, fur cones or fur needles excuse me, are attached to the stem with these little suction cup uh, uh, structures on them, uh, as opposed to these little peg-like things that the that Eastern hemlock or hemlocks have. Uh, so you can pull them off and there'll be a little impression left there. So if anyone has a Fraser fir Christmas tree uh, in their house right now, uh, you might take a look at that, see if you can see those little little tiny suction cups on there. So I'd like to talk about uh, some of the, the species in specific, uh, the, the, the five species that, that are imperiled, I would say, within the, the Southern Appalachians, give you some more information about them, what the threats to them are, and what we're doing to, to try to conserve them. Uh, so the first of these is, is Table Mount Pine. It is a, a rare species, uh, but, you, but you can find it if you know where to look has clusters of two needles, uh, about an inch and a half to two and a half inches long. Uh, really interesting and distinctive thing about them is that they have these cones that look like maces, essentially the, the medieval weapon, right? They've got these stout hooked spines on them uh, or, or um, prickles essentially on the, the ends of the, uh, the scales. So they are, really impressive and a little bit scary looking. Uh, they are, an important aspect of Table Mountain Pine is that they are fire adapted. So they need fire to be able to reg regenerate and that's that's become kind of a problem. Uh, most of their cones are, are sealed uh, or uh, the term for that is serotonous. So they're, they're held together by resin and, and sap in most populations, there's some exceptions. Uh, so what happens is they hold together like that, they'll fall on the ground, they'll sit there for years and years until the fire comes along, uh, which melts the, the solid resin and allows the, the seeds to uh, be released at that point. So uh, Table Mountain Pine needs these periodic low intensity fires to, to kind of clear out competing species uh, and to, to help it open the cones. Uh, it is an Appalachian endemic, so that's a, an important word, endemic. That means if something is endemic to a place, it only grows there. Uh, so it's endemic to the Appalachians, up into the central Appalachians in Pennsylvania, down uh, to northeast Georgia. Uh, it occurs in small isolated populations. So this range map here gives maybe gives you the sense that, you know, it's pretty continuous a lot across the landscape. It isn't, it, it's very patchy. Uh, the populations are, are patchy and, and fairly isolated throughout this uh, region. It occurs at elevations of about 1,000 to uh, 4,000 feet on dry, rocky soils on south or west facing ridgelines. So essentially places that trees, uh, most trees have a hard time growing in. So they have, they sort of have a leg up in those kinds of places because they're hardy. 
tough uh, critters, essentially. And some of the places you can find it, North Carolina, this is not all of the places, but this, this is some of them. Uh, Table Rock Mountain, uh, kind of up toward Boone, Hanging Rock, Stone Mountain, and uh, Looking Glass Rock. Uh, so the issue with Table Mountain Pine is that it's been in decline uh, since the late 1800s. Uh, it was, uh, or even more recently than that, uh, it was once pretty widespread. Uh, now there are only about 200,000 acres of it left. Uh, not all of that very healthy stands. Uh, kind of spotty and, and not uh, good regeneration going on there. Uh, and the reason for that is that we've been suppressing wildfire uh, for more than a century now in, in most of our forests. So it's not, uh, it's having a hard time regenerating with other species that are competing with it uh, in most places. And Southern pine beetle, which is a, a native uh, bark beetle, does cause some mortality too. Uh, there's some efforts to uh, to help the species regenerate by by doing prescribed fire treatments, so doing uh, controlled uh, low intensity fires, uh, and that's working to some degree, but not as well as as I think uh, a lot of people are are hoping or wishing would happen. Uh, so we did a, a genetic diversity study on uh, Table Mountain Pine. It was just published uh, recently. Uh, we found that the populations are highly inbred. Uh, there's a fair amount of interpopulation gene flow. So pollen, even though these populations are very isolated, pollen is being dispersed by wind across large areas. So uh, that is helping them uh, to, to maintain their genetic diversity to, to some degree. Uh, and the conservation implications of that uh, inbreeding is, is a concern, uh, so it's important that we preserve the genetic diversity of the species, uh, but the fact that individual populations are, are connected to each other through pollen flow suggests that uh, we don't need to get out there to every single population to make sure that we're conceiving, or we're, we are conserving the genes in those, uh, in those populations through seed collections and that kind of thing. Uh, so some of the, the, t the gene conservation efforts that have been uh, underway uh, recently are the result of a partnership between CAMCOR, which I talked about, the, the Gene Conservation Cooperative at NC State, and the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, CAMCOR, uh, with funding from the Forest Service, has collected uh, almost half a million seeds from almost 300 mother trees and, and 44 populations. Uh, some of that seed has been used to create seed orchards that uh, eventually, so the, the trees are being planted, they'll grow up and eventually they'll be able to uh, generate seeds of their own, uh, which then will be grown up and allowed to, or then and planted uh, in existing uh, Table Mountain Pine uh, populations to, as a part of a restoration efforts. So uh, one of those is in Tennessee and one of those is in North Carolina, those seed orchards. And then the seeds in storage, there's some at NC State, some at the Forest Service Seed Bank in Mississippi, and some at the U.S. Department of Agriculture Center for Genetic Resources Preservation in Fort Collins, Colorado. So that's one of our species. I'll tackle two together now, the next two. Uh, and these are our hemlocks. Uh, so in the eastern United States, we have two hemlock uh, species. Uh, eastern hemlock, which is widely dispersed uh, from the Great Lakes out to the maritime provinces in Canada, down to Alabama, and then Carolina hemlock, which is, is much more limited to the, the southern Appalachians. Uh, and so hemlocks are, are shade tolerant, uh, about nine species worldwide, uh, and one really sort of distinctive characteristic uh, you can look for with hemlocks is that they have this sort of floppy top. So if you think of um, a lot of conifers, you expect them to have, you know, very sort of, to be very sort of pyramidal, have a sharp top, uh, what's called apical dominance at the top. Uh, but uh, hemlocks have this kind of floppy uh, appearance toward the top of them uh, oftentimes. So eastern hemlock, uh, this is a species that's widespread throughout a lot of the, the eastern uh, US and, and parts of Canada. 
tends toward uh, moisture sites. It's a very important species in the ecology of streamside forests. It, it helps maintain the temperatures of those streams, which affects uh, stream life, including uh, that of fishes and that sort of thing. Uh, tall trees, and they have these needles and flat sprays, and you've seen this picture already. Uh, and that is the way uh, I'll get to uh, keep this in mind uh, it, when I talk about Carolina hemlock in a minute here. Places you can find Eastern hemlock, uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park, uh, Mingus Mills, or the area. Uh, it's a there's a, an old mill site uh, near Cher uh, near Cherokee uh, on the eastern side. That's a good place to find it. Linville Gorge South Mountain State Park, and interestingly enough, uh, Hemlock Bluffs. Uh, park in here in Cary, uh, not very far from Raleigh uh, at all. Uh, and that is, this is a, a very fascinating uh, population in that it, it's a, a glacial relic. So uh, during the, the height of the Pleistocene, probably hemlock existed widely across uh, the southeastern United States. As temperatures warmed, it moved north. Uh, but at Hemlock Bluffs, it's managed to hang on this time because it's a it's a cool north facing uh, moist slope there. So that's so compare eastern hemlock here to Carolina hemlock, and this is this is one of my uh, favorite species. It is really an interesting one. Uh, it's endemic to scattered and isolated locations in the Southern Appalachians. So, you know, again, this map may look like it. It's pretty continuously occurring throughout uh, eastern or western North Carolina, and that is not the case. It, uh, there are maybe 40 or 50 populations in total uh, in these places. It is not a continuous distribution. Uh, it tends toward dry, rocky soils, generally in uplands, uh, 23 to uh, 100 to, to 4,000 feet. So uh, there are some places where Carolina hemlock and eastern hemlock occur together, but typically. Uh, Eastern hemlock is going to be in lower moisture, uh, cooler kinds of places, while Carolina hemlock hangs out in places where it's harder to be a tree, essentially. Uh, its needles are in this sort of bottle brush arrangement, uh, as opposed to the flat sprays, and the cones are a little bit larger than in Eastern hemlocks. In some places to find it, in North Carolina, DuPont State Park, Linville Gorge, South Mountain State Park, uh, Mount Jefferson State Park. And again, these are just some places. There are many others uh, that I can point you to as well if, if you're interested. Let me take a drink here. So the issue for both of our hemlocks is this little critter here called the hemlock woolly adelgid, which was introduced into the United States from Asia uh, in the 1950s. Uh, Initially, it was very limited in its uh, in its distribution around the area of Richmond, Virginia. Uh, but over the last 20, 25 years or so, it has spread throughout much of the range of of uh, eastern hemlock, covered the entire range of Carolina hemlock, uh, and it can be fatal to them in uh, as few as four, or as many as, as 15 years. And there are some places like Shenandoah National Park and parts of the Smokies uh, where there's been 95% mortality. Um, this is this picture is from a, an electron microscope, I think. Um, you can see how small they are. Uh, they're called woolly adelgids because when they're in their feeding phase, they anchor themselves to the tree and then they cover themselves with this kind of uh, woolly fuzz kind of stuff to, to protect themselves. Uh, and what they do is they uh, they have, can't really see it in this picture, but they have this these really long, narrow, uh, piercing, sucking mouth parts that they insert into the bases of the needles, and then they feed on uh, the nutrients that are, uh, that uh, are, uh, moving from the leaves down uh, to the roots of the tree. Uh, and that's thought to essentially cause a, an overreaction by the, the tree species, or, or by the tree itself, sorry. Uh, and that ends up restricting the, the water transport and, and essentially the, the tree ends up dying of thirst. Let's see. Uh, this is the distribution of hemlock woolly adelgid as of last year. 
So you can see the entirety of the Carolina Hemlock Range is covered and um, certainly most of the range in the eastern U.S. It's still a little bit cool for it up here uh, in Canada and the like, but as climate warms, it, it's probably going to move up there as well. Uh, so we have done genetic diversity studies on, on both of these species. Uh, and for Carolina hemlock, we found su somewhat surprising to us. It was very, it had very high inbreeding, not necessarily a surprise since it has, it exists in these fairly small isolated populations, but these populations, many of the populations had unique genes uh, that were not present anywhere else in the landscape. Uh, so that suggested there's very little gene flow by pollen or seed between these isolated populations. Uh, and that was really interesting and, and surprising to us. And there are conservation implications of this. So high inbreeding, you know, we need to, to preserve the genetic diversity of the species quickly because, you know, if it's too inbred, uh, then it may have issues with environmental changes and, and uh, being able to persist on the landscape. But since we've got this high differentiation between populations and a lot of unique uh, genes, uh, the gene conservation efforts really need to focus on including as many uh, separate populations as possible. So again, uh, CAMCOR and the US Forest Service have been working to conserve the, the genetic uh, diversity of uh, Carolina hemlock by doing seed collections uh, and other things beginning in 2003. Uh, they've collected seeds from uh, 200 some mother trees and 29 different populations. The seeds are in storage for the long term. Uh, so we've got that as, as sort of an insurance policy. But what CAMCOR and the Forest Service have, has done has been to, to plant uh, three seed orchards uh, with one of them now uh, already producing seeds, as you can see here, uh, that will then be uh, available for, for restoring populations uh, in, the, in the medium to long term. When looking at eastern hemlock uh, genetic diversity, we found that we found evidence that the Southern Appalachians were an important ice age refuge for, for Eastern hemlock. Remember uh, this uh, as um, temperatures cooled and warmed, species were moving north and south uh, and a lot of species hung out in the, in the Appalachian region and there was sort of a genetic signature of that with Eastern hemlock. Um, we also found that isolated populations had unique genes, but you know, Eastern hemlock has a pretty um, extensive uh, population it's it's not uh, it doesn't exist just in in isolated kind of pockets like uh, uh, like Carolina hemlock does um, so conservation efforts here need to focus on areas of high genetic variation with an em emphasis on the southern Appalachians and then we need to make sure we're getting uh, those distinct populations represented as well so again uh, camp core has collected seed from a lot of mother trees, almost 600 and 80 some different populations. Uh, and they've planted about 600 trees in two seed orchards that are not producing seeds yet uh, for restoration, but that's the, the long-term goal. So I'd like to talk about one of my uh, favorite species. Uh, I like Carolina hemlock, but Fraser fir is, is probably my, my favorite conifer. Uh, possibly anywhere, certainly in, in our neck of the woods. Uh, it's endemic to North Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia in seven small populations. Uh, it is a boreal species, so uh, related to species, to balsam fir species that grows uh, widely in Canada, found in these mo moist and cool conditions above about uh, 5,500 feet. Uh, and becomes the dominant uh, tree species uh, above 6,000 feet. So uh, it's the species you see at the, the very top of Mount Mitchell, for example, in the Black Mountains, the highest point in North Carolina. Uh, so that's one place to find it, Grandfather Mountain, uh, Roan Mountain, Klingman, Klingman's Dome, Great Smoky Mountains, those are, are places where it's fairly easily accessible. Uh, the Blue Ridge Parkway, uh, runs through this region here as well, so you can find it there also. 
Uh, it is the foundation of North Carolina's Christmas tree industry. Uh, second to none, in, in my opinion, uh, North, in terms of the quality of the tree. Uh, North Carolina is the second in the nation in Christmas tree production. It's a really important economic uh, factor up in uh, the mountains in North Carolina. Uh, our state produces about 20% of the real Christmas trees in the United States. Fraser fir is the most uh, popular Christmas tree in North America, and there are about 1,300 growers producing Fraser fir in about 40,000 acres in North Carolina. And those are places that are uh, lower at lower elevations than uh, where it grows in, in natural stands. Uh, and I have one in my living room right now. The issue with the, nat the natural stands of uh, Fraser fir is this critter called balsam woolly adelgid, related to the hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, was introduced from Europe uh, around 1900, was discovered in the Black Mountains near Mount Mitchell uh, in the late 50s, uh, around the time that uh, we began to see extensive mortality of uh, Fraser fir in some of these populations. Uh, there's 90% mortality in, in some places. Uh, it's, uh, so what it, it does, like the hemlock woolly adelgid, it, it sticks its uh, mouth parts into the, into the tree, but in this case, the stem as opposed to the base of the leaves. So if you see a tree like this that, that is covered in, in what looks like uh, cotton or whatever, that, um, that is balsam woolly adelgid. Uh, and again, it, it affects water transport. Uh, in the this, the tree uh, that results in in the tree uh, essentially dying of thirst. Uh, younger trees, unlike hemlocks, largely es escape infestation. And uh, we've had pretty good regeneration since the first wave of mortality, so we're hoping that we're not going to see this again. Uh, but we are kind of keeping our eyes out to see uh, if we're going to have uh, additional. Um, mass mortality as a result of balsam oleodelgid. So we did a, a Fraser fir genetic diversity study a while ago. Uh, we found that the populations are well mixed compared to other conifers. Despite being isolated and small in size, you remember uh, Carolina hemlock had issues apparently with getting pollen from one population to another and staying sort of connected genetically like that. That's not the issue with, with Fraser fir being on these mountaintops. Apparently, uh, pollen is being blown across great distances to keep these populations connected to each other. Um, there is high inbreeding, uh, which is some concern, uh, but it's less important to thoroughly sample every population for, for its seed collections. In NC State and Camcorn, the Forest Service, uh, and the North Carolina Christmas Tree Growers Association have uh, conducted a number of uh, seed collections. This is one that I organized uh, a while back. Uh, these seeds are in, in storage. Uh, there are no uh, conservation seed orchards uh, established yet. There's a plan to do that. Uh, there are seed orchards uh, that uh, have been established to provide seeds to or seedlings to uh, Christmas tree growers, however, so those do exist. Last species here is red spruce, and this is a species that you find a lot of times in association with Fraser fir. Uh, it has a relatively broad range in the in the northeast, and occurs in in small and isolated populations in the southern Appalachians. Again, it's a boreal species. Uh, so in, in uh, Canadian kind of environments, really moist and cool conditions, it's found at lower elevations than a Fraser fir, uh, down to about 3,500 feet, becomes dominant uh, from about 55 to 6,200 feet. It's kind of mixed with Fraser fir, and then it's replaced by Fraser fir at the highest elevations. And you can find it in the same places that you find Fraser fir, Mount Mitchell, Run Mountain, Kling's, Klingman's Dome, uh, those kinds of places. Uh, its issue is uh, different than the other species in that uh, it's not being affected by any uh, pest or pathogen, uh, anything like that. Uh, but it uh, during that that period of, of heavy 
uh, logging and unsustainable uh, forestry practices back in the, the late 1800s and early 1900s, about 50% of the red spruce forests were eliminated in the Southern Appalachians. So the logging was intense. Uh, it happens during sort of a droughty period. Uh, and um, what happened was that uh, the timber companies would uh, build these railroads up to the highest to these high locations up in the mountains. It happened during a dry period. Uh, the uh, railroads would give off sparks that then led to wildfires that, that burned down to the mineral soil. And as a result of that, uh, it has had trouble uh, regenerating in a lot of places. So this is an interesting example of that. This is outside the Shining Rock Wilderness area in the Balsam Mountains in, in North Carolina. Uh, this you can see this this line here. This is not really natural and something you would expect to see very often in forests, but this is the the footprint of a fire that happened uh, probably at least 100 years ago that burned down to the mineral soil, uh, but ended here. And not far from here, I found a, uh, a railroad spike a, a along the trail. So um, scene of the crime uh, may be there to some degree. Um, during the 1980s, you uh, there was some concern about acid deposition from fog and rain and the like affecting the soils and, and the health of the trees. Uh, but those conditions have improved as a result of uh, the regulation of power plants in the, the Tennessee Valley and, and that sort of thing. And now climate change is, is also a concern as it is for the other species as well. Uh, as the climate warms, uh, and it warms beyond sort of uh, the the uh, the range that uh, these species have been uh, exposed to during you know the last couple of million years. Uh, they may essentially they'll be pushed upward uh, in elevation. At some point, they're going to run out of real estate, possibly. So, uh, so that is a concern. Uh, we have not done a genetic diversity study for red spruce yet, uh, but there is some red spruce gene conservation work, again, with con uh, CAMCOR. Uh, they've collected from about 130 mother trees from 19 populations. They've got seeds in storage. Uh, they don't have any plans to establish a conservation, a conservation seed orchard now, but maybe at, at some point. So to, to summarize, the Southern Appalachians have uh, amazing tree diversity, uh, including conifers. It is it is really an amazing place to go. Uh, and I encourage you, if you have not been there, and if you have, you should go back uh, and really try to pay attention to the, the biodiversity you find there, not just the, the trees, but the understory plants, birds, salamanders, if you're interested in, in looking for, for critters like that. Uh, there are five conifer species that are at particular risk uh, in the southern Appalachians, including in, in North Carolina, and uh, efforts are underway to, to conserve these species because they are really, uh, they're really special, I think. They're important to keep on our landscape. They are a part of our, our natural and cultural heritage uh, in North Carolina, so uh, we want to keep them around. Uh, so a lot of people have helped with uh, this work in, uh, in various ways, and uh, I am happy to uh, answer any questions, and I, I very much appreciate your time, uh, and uh, I hope that maybe we've um, managed to uh, inspire some, some curiosity and, and some interest in these, these interesting species. Kevin, uh, thank you. Thank you. That, that was, was very, very informative, informative and I appreciate the information. Uh, I'm going to take the advantage of being unmuted right now and kick off the questions and then we'll let others unmute and ask questions as they arise. So I have a couple, but I'll hold mine to one at the time. So the Table Mountain Pine um, is outside of my knowledge base. So that's the first time I've seen anything about that, but I do have some familiarity with um, Longleaf. So the the serotonous cones, are they fire dependent, I'm assuming? And does the 
um, the plant itself go through the similar stages like the bottle brush stage and all that that is similar to a lava lolly or to a long leaf that we see around here uh no it doesn't actually so that's uh not so that so long leaf pine it has it's as as chris is is indicating starts in this this sort of grass stage so it looks like a tuft of grass initially and what it's doing is it's uh building up roots underground uh, and when it's in that sort of grass stage, it's really uh, it's less susceptible to damage from from fire. So longleaf pine does it. There's another species called slash pine further south that that does that as well. Table mountain pine does not do that. So it's um, it shoots up like like most pines do. Uh, the cones can open uh, if they're just heated, right? So um, during a warm summer period, for example, it is possible they'll they'll open up, but uh, fire is is sort of the most effective way to to open those up and release the seeds. Awesome, thank you. Um, anybody else? If you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. Um, I'll give it a few seconds before I jump in with my follow up questions. Give others a chance. I actually have one similar question to you. Uh, so is the Table Mountain Pine the only uh, tree in the Southern App area that has serotonin, uh, serotonin cones? Uh, it is the only species that has serotonin cones most of the time. So I think that, um, I think, Virginia pine sometimes can have uh, serotonous cones, uh, tends not to, um, and pitch pine may also. So pitch pine is another uh, Appalachian pine species. I, occasionally, I think uh, it, it'll have serotonous cones, but not uh, predominantly so, like like Table Mountain pine. It's interesting, you know. It's a that's a pretty common uh, cone strategy for for pine species out west, uh, but it's not so much in the east. And it, that makes sense because there's a lot more fire in the western U.S. than there is out this way. It's a pretty cool species. Uh, yeah, those cones are. The cones really are are something else, uh, and there really aren't any that look that nasty <laughs> out in this part of the country. You got west of California. There's a species called Coulter pine that look kind of like that, but they're ginormous. They're like this big. <laughs> uh, they're called uh, the miners used to call those widow makers because you wouldn't want to have that fall on you or if you're camping under the tree, for example. Kevin, we have a request to go back to the, if we could go back to the cone slide. Somebody wants to be able to look at that again. Okay. This one? So, yeah, uh, so I'll reiterate again here. So, so pines, really woody, tend to be fairly large. Uh, they're robust. You know, um, most people know what a what a pine cone looks like. Uh, the eastern or hemlock, eastern and Carolina, these these cones are pretty small. Uh, so Car eastern, you know, it's going to be an inch, two inches, maybe Carolina, three, maybe four inches. Uh, spruce cones uh, are tend to be bigger, and they. Uh, they tend not to sort of look as splayed out, I guess, uh, which is not a scientific term, but uh, as as Carolina cones, um, I think spruce cones um, are aesthetically pleasing, I guess, for some reason. I, they they just um, they've got these sort of smooth edges on the scales and uh, are just kind of nice to nice to look at, I guess. 
Uh, and then the fur cones. So these are um, so these are the really weird ones in that they're uh, they're on top of the trees or they're upright, typically at the very top of the tree, uh, and then they they break apart too. Uh, and one thing about the Fraser fir uh, cones in particular, you can see these little things sticking out. Uh, so these are called bracts. Uh, so it's a part of the the cone structure. So the other the the darker part is the scale. The larger part the larger lighter part of these is is the bracts. Uh, this is a that's an important characteristic in, di di in differentiating Fraser fir from balsam fir, which occurs farther north. And there's interestingly, I didn't talk about it uh, in this talk, but there is a, a form of fir that's called intermediate fir that grows in uh, parts of Virginia and West Virginia uh, that has just a little bit of the, the bracts uh, sticking out of the cone. Uh, so um, it's, it's, a, it's a, a variety of uh, balsam fir, but you know it's, it's probably related to, to Fraser fir as well. And that seemed to be what our, uh, some of our genetic work uh, indicated. So is that, that helpful uh, in terms of being able to, to differentiate these a bit? You know, and uh, what happens with some of these species, less so with pines, but with some of these other things, they, uh, they produce cones on cycles. So it would be every two, three, maybe four years. Uh, so you can go years without seeing many Fraser fir cones, and then they will be, and for reasons we, we're not entirely clear about, there will be a big cone year. Trees will just be laden with these things. Um, and uh, that's a, you know, when you're doing seed conservation, conservation collecting for, for seeds, you have to kind of take advantage of those, uh, those years when they happen. It's called masting. And one hypothesis for why that happens is that essentially, you know, the trees are, are putting all their seeds out there all at once so that uh, squirrels and, and other seed predators are not um, gobbling them all up. Uh, they just can't, they can't keep up with the number of seeds that are, that are out there. So some are, they're more likely to, to get established and create uh, new trees when that happens. Perfect. Thank you, Kevin. We have time for about one more question if anybody else has one. So I, again, I encourage people to, you know, if you can get up to the mountains, uh, we do have, we have a, a great deal of uh, forest diversity down this way as well. Uh, and really, you know, you don't have to go that far at all to see Hemlock with uh, Hemlock Bluffs and being in Cary. And that's, uh, there are only about 70 trees there. Uh, and that's a conservation concern and, you know, uh, the town of Cary and, and Camcourt, NC State are, are uh, first of all, protecting those trees by treating them with uh, insecticide to make sure that they're not being killed by the, the adelgids, which have been found at that population, but also making sure that we're, uh, that we're conserving the genetic diversity that exists there because it's it is an extremely inbred population there's not a lot of diversity there so that that's definitely a, a concern but it's really an interesting site it's a beautiful place uh you know just to hike around uh particularly early spring into the summer when um you have um the spring ephemeral wildflowers blooming in, on the floor of the forest and, and that kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, I encourage folks to, to check out Hemlock Bluffs if, uh, if a trip to Asheville or Boone or whatever is not in the offing. It's a great place. Uh, so I have, it's a good question for our last one. Is there a known reason why the balsam adelgid avoids young trees? Right. So 
what happens is uh, it's inserting its uh, its stylet, its its mouth parts into cracks in the bark. Uh, so a tree has to get large enough so that the bark starts to form cracks in it. Um, you know, to, you may notice in, in smaller trees a lot of times, uh, particularly uh, or including conifers, there you know there are. The, the bark is going to be very smooth uh, and there's not really anywhere where they can they can stick their uh, their mouth, mouth parts into the uh, into the bark to be able to get to the nutrients in the, the xylem. Which is fortunate. <laughs> not so fortunate with the with the hemlocks. I mean, it's they're really doing a number on uh, on hemlocks and they are not regenerating nearly as well as uh, as the as Fraser fir is after its infestation. Well, that puts us at a time. It is now eight o'clock. Uh, Kevin, I appreciate you joining us and sharing your expertise and knowledge. Um, if anybody has any follow up questions, feel free to email and respond to the invite you got tonight, and we will do our best to get some communication out. For those that are participating in credit um, certifications, such as environmental educators, we will be sending out a notice or an email with the uh, form B following up this meeting uh, shortly in the next few days. Thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out and we'll answer the best we can. And we will have another lecture series coming up in January. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.